Barbados has recorded a steady increase in COVID-19 cases over the past few weeks. This has forced the government to implement additional restrictions in a bid to reduce the spread of the virus. An extended curfew and a halt to indoor dining at fast food restaurants are among the measures. On this one-on-one, -on -one, we get a better idea of what is actually happening in the facilities caring for those who have contracted COVID-19 and just how serious the situation is. A very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord and my special guest is infectious disease specialist and head of the isolation facilities here in Barbados, Dr. Corey Ford. Dr. Ford, I know you're a very busy person. I really appreciate you spending some time with us this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here, not being on, on national TV for a while. That's okay. Yeah, the, the last time we sat down was back in mid-February. It's a long time um, ago. Yeah, it is. And back then our numbers were high. Seven months later, they're high again. We have just over 600 people in isolation facilities across the island. And we also have Delta. Now, just to describe, I want you to describe what is happening in our isolation facilities, especially the Harrison Point facility at this time on a day-to-day -day basis to give Barbadians an idea of the situation. So I think at this point, you know, where we are in country, we are going through another difficult point. And I, I always choose to speak when I think that, you know, we're a critical point, an inflection point. And in terms of what's going on at Harrison's point, I just want to first relate what I believe is going on in country at this particular point. And I, the only thing I can possibly relate this to is an airplane going through a storm. And I believe, you know, sometimes if people fly, they will understand something. And it's simply this, you're about to go through bad weather and the pilot comes on and says, hey, you know, the next hour or hour and a half, we accept, expect some rough weather, but we're gonna to try to get you through that weather. But I think the important part of that is simply this. For us to get to that point where we get past that bad weather, it will require many in country to act, to do what they're supposed to do to get us through, through this. It's not only for us healthcare workers to do. And I think the work at Harson's Point, which is going on right now, is, is quite extensive. People might wonder what we do there. We've shown that on national TV before. Mm -hmm. We've taken people in, for example, but people might want to know now what's going on. Well, I'll give you a brief update on that. So if you think about Harson's Point facility, you know we have many areas there. We have the primary isolation area where we have a large ICU contingent of people, all the fancy machines, and active pressure area, et cetera. And that's staffed by our ICU staff there. We have a secondary isolation area, which is being made into primary. And I think that this, to my mind, as you go through a storm, sometimes you need things to keep you steady. And I think one of the major changes that's happened from February or March when I last spoke to you, mm -hmm. which is absolutely different and occurred maybe within a two weeks period, was we were able to create another ICU area within the secondary. I think, from my mind, if all the money that's ever been spent on COVID this was one of the smartest things that I think that has been invested in Harson's Point in providing oxygen in that area. I think you sit in there and I sit in here and listen and searching to, to media, searching to what's going on in social media. We all recognize one thing that countries in the world have struggled with the advent of Delta in terms of providing oxygen supplies to their population of individuals who are obviously ill and required oxygen. What we did was to extend that building in terms of oxygen with support, of course, from the Board of Management Hospital and at the highest levels of this country, um, Prime Minister really went all out, I would say, to try to have that area outfitted in quick and speedy fashion so that Barbadians, if they do get ill, to the extent that we override red or ICU, that we will have that capacity in country. People have seen in Jamaica and many other countries where they ran out of oxygen mm -hmm. and I will say at this point that I'm quite confident um, that, you know, we have, you know, a level of oxygen play that is good. But I will always say one never knows what's going to happen in the midst of the storm. But I think that we have control as citizens of this country in what is to come. And I think we can make the changes in our population now that will allow for those changes to occur, which will prevent us from getting into some of the trouble that we're seeing globally within the Caribbean. And yes, in the Caribbean, um, when we compare ourselves to many of the others in the Caribbean, 
you know, things don't look um, that bad. But I'm saying when you start a storm, you don't know what you're going to meet in the middle of the storm. And it's with that that I would advise Barbadians to work with us. Don't work against us. Work with us. Listen, do the things, and I'll talk about that more, yes, um, during the course that will be important. But Harsh's point, to, to let people understand what has happened and how things have changed over the last month, and this is really why I'm here, because I, I honestly believe that we are a, a serious point. And it's either when we enter the storm that we're going to crash or we're going to make it to the next side. And every single Barbadian listening out there today has that choice. You have to decide whether you, we as a country, are going to make it to the other side. There are critical decisions that people have to make. There are people who will be on that plane with you who can't make that decision because of different entities, and I'll talk about that later. But at Harson's point, there are a bunch of young people. I think the average age, as I looked at it today, is somewhere between um, 25 and 26 years of age individuals. This represents the younger population. And I think often young people get the bad rap for stuff. But I think a lot of young people have stepped forward. We have had a situation where we've been planning. I saw this coming miles away. And we've been planning for months now. Um, we've trained more than I think uh, my infection control um, assistant today told me we've trained more than very close to 200 individuals at the end of the day extra um, to fight this battle ahead, mm -hmm. to keep the plane from falling out the sky. We've, we've really trained those individuals and we started to deploy them across the facilities which we set up across country. And that's important. Training is important and retraining is important. And they're confident. Why are they confident? Because I think they all know that we are a really, really, really important point in country. But I say that, and I, then I say this, which is very important. And I, I, I don't even think that the average Barbadian understands what's going on right now. And, and, and I say that because, Lisa, when I, when I drive around, when I pass shops, when I pass supermarkets, when I, the bus stops, it's unbelievable that people with all that's going on would not even wear a mask. And I understand it's difficult. I know people are tired of COVID, but the other end is us. There are many people who've worked 20 hour, 24 hour shifts, Lisa, 24 hours. They don't have to, but they do it because they do it for what purpose? To protect or to help people, right? I myself, there are many nights that I have not slept. <laughs> people know me many nights I haven't slept because I've been worried about this or worried about that or worried about this patient, etc. I'm thinking about what is to come tomorrow. And there are many of these young people, again, who, without even asking for any remunerations, have come out in the middle of the night. I remember a few nights ago when the numbers were huge. I mean, I didn't have to ask my team to come down to help. They have showed up on the ground. Let's, let's do this forward. Let's get things organized. Let's get, you know, the 90 so many people we have to admit. Let's get it going. Let's get the people off the bus. Let's get the people on the bus. Let's get to the other facility. You know, people came out because they understand the importance of where we are in country. And if we get this wrong, if Barbadians don't do their part, it is going to be a sad state. I never, ever want to see this country look like some of the others in the region. Mm -hmm. I never, ever want to see this country look like some of the countries um, in South America. I think this part of the world really has not seen, even in the first and second wave, the sort of challenges that they're seeing now. And I think Delta has brought something that I think that many in the Caribbean thought would never come. And that's the challenge. People always believe it can't happen here. It can't be us. But it starts somewhere and it starts slowly. If I admit, to be frank with you, if I admit 50 people a day, six or seven of them end up in my ICU, or four or five of them end up on oxygen, I just want you to do the mathematics. If I did that every day for the next two weeks, I will fill my ICU. Given the average length of stay in a person in a ventilator, whether non-invasive or invasive ventilation, meaning you either put it down the throat or you have it on the outside, is about 21 days. Just imagine how much turmoil we're mm -hmm. going to be in. We have a chance. I honestly, I came here, Lisa, because I believe we have a chance to make the wrongs right. 
I really do. But, but it's going to take people to act. And I'll talk about what some of those actions, you know, need to be as we're going through the midst of the storm. Sure. Now, outside of the Harrison's Point and Blackman and Gallup isolation facilities, several other schools are being utilized. Can you speak to those at this time? Yes. So again, uh, that requires staffing and I'll talk about the impact that has in our healthcare system in general, because you only have a finite amount of people mm -hmm. to deploy and a finite amount of resources. Thank God we have the Cubans to assist. And, and thank God even more that we had the Ghanaians who are on the ground who have been, I mean, uh, quite amazing in this fight and battle. And I think I have to acknowledge um, um, these groups of individuals who have really stood up for us as well as we're going through this turbulent moment in history. And there are many other areas we've set up. So um, a couple of days ago, we set up the Les Devon School, um, and that has a, a, a much larger capacity, quite close to 200 individuals. Um, prior to that, um, we set up Queen's College School as well, um, and that also has a capacity of there. We have a full capacity as of today. We set up uh, the Darrell Jordan School in St. Lucie. It's pretty close to St. Lucie um, um, in terms of pretty close to Harrison Point, point. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and that allows us to maneuver a bit if someone got ill, it's easy passes. So the system is set up that you kind of move through the system and move out. And of course, people forget we have one hotel, which is Sambay Hotel, we also have set up as well. So you'll see there are a large number of facilities, and these facilities need to be manned with a finite amount of resources. I think that's the other part, right? So people will get tired. Many of my staff were tired. We were chatting before. I mean, I would have come on to speak today, but and one of the things I, I would have mentioned to you is that one of my nurses, she's a strong soul. Mm -hmm. She is. And she came to me and said, Dr. Ford. And I looked at her and I almost did not want to look directly in her eyes because I, I felt what she was going to say even before she said it. She's one who never complains. Very, very nice. Never complains. And it, it's, it has gone above and beyond. And the nurses have, and I really want a congratulation for that. She looked at me and said, God, for, for the first time, I will tell you that I am tired. I am, I'm just tired of all of this. I'm tired of this situation. And when one of your staff who's thought to be, we have the psychological support, mind you, but right. when one of your staff that you know is one of your strongest people who often hold things together, especially in tertiary isolation, and they stand up and tell you that it, it sends shivers to your body. And I think, and this is why I said before, I think Arvish Barbena has no idea. And, and I, I mean, I will tell people this. And I always say if patients in, in, in the facility, they'll tell you when I have general meetings with patients, which I do on several occasions, and they'll tell you this. I think the problem is that people feel well sometimes, but there's lots of stuff going on in your body that you do not understand. That's something that I don't even understand as the doctor. And people will stand as, and I've seen it up to yesterday, at least three times yesterday, young people, 30-something, 40-something, 25, 19 years of age, and they're looking at you like everything is normal and you're doing their vitals and you're looking at the amount of oxygen in their blood and you're like, this is crazy. This is insane. I want to come back to that. And I want to stick on the point, as you mentioned, the nurses being overwhelmed at this stage. Now, with more isolation facilities, you need more human resources. I saw the QEH put out a notice a few days ago for nurses to come forward and work with the facilities. How has the feedback been to that yeah. call? Yeah, I can't speak directly to that, Lisa, but what I would say is that I would expect the nursing fraternity to stand up, and they have in the past. Um, and I, I, like I said, the, the nurses we have on the ground work really hard. I know there are constituency plans um, for these things, but like I said, they're only a finite amount of resources. And you can't work people above and beyond and burn mm -hmm. themselves out because mm -hmm. then you're just going to lose the battle. You're going basic, to crash, basically. Um, so I think um, the focus has to be on, um, yes, um, getting um, nurses to come forward to assist in the area, but also recognize that despite that, despite that, them coming forward in for nice facilities, there still needs to be a, a continuous level of care within the community. There's still diabetes. Mm -hmm. There's still hypertension. 
there are still people who have heart attacks and strokes and pulmonary embolism, embolisms. There are people who still have those things and they still need that level of care as well. So although we need them in isolation, we also need nurses as well within the general hospital system. Within our polyclinic sector, it still has to continue. Vaccinations with other vaccines need to continue. Maternal health care needs to continue. People who come to fast track, for example, that still needs to continue. So this is why health, health systems globally have overrun. I don't think there's any country on earth that's gotten this totally correct. But I think we we'll learn as we go along and we have to put the resources in, in places which are going to take care of all of, of every single Barbadian. And I think that's, that's generally and honestly where we're going at this particular point. But this is certainly, Lisa, a very, very difficult time. Like I said before, I almost feel that we are five minutes from entering a storm and we're feeling the first set of winds as the airplane goes in. And it's up to us if we're gonna make it through or if, we're, or if it's gonna be, be tragic. I don't want to see any Barbadians die. You would have known um, that we'd have had um, deaths recently. And honestly, if we continue on this trajectory, we will look no different than many of our Caribbean neighbors. I think many Barbadians believe that God is a Barbadian. Hmm. But I think I'm going to say this, if I'm allowed to say, is that we as Barbadians need to put our faith in God. Yes, I totally believe that as a Christian. But all, what I also believe is this. I believe that God has given people or persons a vision, ideas, principle, but he's also given people knowledge to help guide you through the storm. And if you don't take it, then what do you expect at the end? And as I say, faith without works is dead. That's right. No, I spoke to Nurse Brathwaite um, about two, three weeks ago. She had severe COVID-19 symptoms. She also has long COVID. She has diabetes. She never had diabetes before. She's dealing with heart issues and she still has issues breathing. Now, you said even in your profession, things are happening in people's bodies that you cannot explain. Break that down for me as best as you can. So I remember, I remember this nurse specifically mm. because I would have managed her at Black Mangala um, during a very difficult time and she was scared. I think I remember specifically this because I remember somebody uh, would have died literally within her vicinity. And it's quite difficult. I think for those who get through COVID well, good for you but everyone won't. And it was difficult for her, I just seen, and being a nurse, mm -hmm. not understanding what was going on, it was even more difficult. Um, and um, you know, she got through that first part of the disease, but on going home, um, she has some challenges. Post-COVID syndrome is real. There are many post-COVID syndromes, people call it long COVID, or do you wanna call it? And many of those things can be neurological. So from fogginess in the brain, right to been a memory impairment, to some other fancy neurological signs. But it can also be, we've seen in some individuals, development of diabetes progression, which is something that's already here in Barbados. We well know, um, one, probably one of the worst in Caribbean in terms of statistics. Um, and then other things as well. We've seen people with, who develop thyroid disease after, for example. It's another classical one as well. Hair loss is another one um, that people don't think about. There's a lot of debate as to whether <laughs> there's any impact in terms of um, um, impotence, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a big debate, that raging debate that's going on right now. So there are many other things. So people think, oh, it's just COVID and I get that and I had much symptoms or whatever. It's just the flu. But the pulse complications are real and people have experienced them. I think if I look back at this particular pandemic and this um, infection, where basically one of the areas I think if I look back and say, hey, um, Corey, you need to probably pay a little bit more attention to it. it's the post-COVID manifestations, which are severe. We know the ones in kids, I'm not a pediatrician, mm -hmm. but we know the ones in kids can even lead to fatalities in, in children as well. So this is not a joke. It's not just, you know, I don't really care. Um, you don't know if it's going to be you, and that's exactly the problem, right? You're flying in a plane, Lisa. You don't know who the pilot is. You just hear a voice, but you don't know who it is. Are you going to make bad decisions? Are they going to make bad decisions, sorry? Are they going to make a good decision? 
you don't know. But I think you have to, um, Barbados have to be trusted. They have to understand that decisions that are made have consequences. And I think if they work with us through this difficult time, if they listen, if they do some of the things uh, which I think are important, uh, which I'll speak about later, then I, I, I honestly believe that we may be able to pull this back um, from, from a very turbulent, turbulent experience. But I wanted to stick on that point you made earlier about 19, 20 year olds, you're taking their vitals, they seem normal, but their oxygen levels and other stats are off the charts. You it, say it, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, uh, and I'll share something you probably don't know. I think um, less than a week ago, a few, few days ago, I would say we had our first, one of our first deliveries in Barbados with a COVID positive uh, mother. Mm -hmm. um, baby's fine. Mm -hmm. Mommy's fine. They're young. But go back to exactly what you were saying just now. For me, as a physician, knowing when people's oxygen and their blood drop low, how they're supposed to respond, COVID is something different. Um, 20, 31 years old. I could call the numbers because I remember each and every one of them like every day. Like, you know, 31 years old, 41 years old. 19 year old they're all scared when you tell them the oxygen in their blood but the problem is at that point they feel well mm -hmm. and i keep saying if you hear me say it over and over again you feel well until you don't and your body can only sustain that sort of level for a certain time and then things go down too. right i was about to get to that because with nurse braffitt for instance she said that she deteriorated very quickly and this is the point Mm -hmm. This is the point, Lisa. I keep telling the patients when I have the patients meeting, if any of them ever called in on a call-in program and they'll say, Dr. Ford always says this, I know you feel well, you want to go home, you think everything is okay and you don't know why you're here. And some of those people are the people that we pull out on a daily basis. A day ago, we pulled three or four people, right, out of our tertiary isolation area. who are all young. They're all old people. They're all young people who are now in the ICU. And this is exactly it. They were, they were well until they were not. And it happens extremely quickly. So in the morning, you're feeling fine. You have an itchy throat. You take your vitals. The stats are like 96%. Uh, we're watching you carefully. And, and by, by evening, by night, you're short of breath. Somebody in the room is calling out. And we go into action. This is how it's been. Well, we're admitting 93 people. This is why I'm telling people, you know, you just got to listen. You just got to wear your mask. You just have to go and get vaccinated and be done with this, right? We have to get back some sense of normalcy in our healthcare system, in our lives, in our daily living. We have to, but it's up to, up to what people do. Nobody wants to lock down, right? I don't want to lock down. I probably didn't. But we have a slow down now. I don't want to lock down. <laughs> I don't even want to slow down. But the truth is, Lisa, to be honest, um, people say that, but then they don't do the things. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, mm. right? I think it's the prime minister who says, apply your heart to common sense. Yes, <laughs> incline your heart <laughs> to common sense. Incline your heart, there you go, <laughs> right? Incline your heart to common sense. Mm. I'm like, if you don't want something bad to happen, but you know there's something that can help you from getting there, and people who have the knowledge to tell, guide you through that, right, then, then do it. I know if I get COVID, I know if you get COVID, what complications can come out. I know the complications. I know I can end up on a ventilator. I might not, but I might. Who does that impact? That impact our healthcare system, yes. That impact the workers, you know, working for more than 21 days trying to save your life on a ventilator. That, that involves um, young people coming in and cleaning and making sure the environment is clean. That also involves your own family, your children. You might not be there with them. I think um, Sophia's story is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. you, it passed your children. Impacts what goes on in your household. If you're the only sole breadwinner in your household, how does that impact you? These are the things that you got to think about. It's not a joke. It's not fun. It impacts every single thing along the line. It impacts the whole country. If things continue to spread, I'm not a politician. But if things continue to spread, the same things that we would need to help us are not going to be there. How has Delta changed things? Delta has ravished the globe. And if I use um, Iceland as an example, they're fully well vaccinated, and although they have cases of COVID, 
You know, people are not toppling over death. I don't think they had the death for a long time. And Delta has changed the landscape of what we think. And there may be other variants. The longer we take to get vaccinated and stop some of the spread of these variants, the longer we will remain in this sort of state globally. Delta has changed that platform for us. Delta is extremely transmissible. Like, extremely transmissible, Lisa. Extremely transmissible. If I live in a household and one person has Delta and mm, nobody's wearing a mask and the person's coughing or sneezing or talking or singing because they're feeling well and they're singing like normal, you could be assured that everybody in that household is like that. And I will tell you, that's what Harrison's point looks like. Families in droves are coming down with COVID. If one get missed, they'll get caught in, in five days on a repeat test. You're having multiple families across the country being admitted to the facility. And people within those families are getting ill. And since we last spoke in February, you're now seeing a lot more children. Yes. It is heartbreaking, Lisa. Honestly, it is heartbreaking. You know why it's heartbreaking? It's because we have the capacity to change that. Mm -hmm. the, the adults, can I share you that? As I said, I just now remembered something. There's this young, I will never forget him for the rest of my life, honestly. There's this young English young man. He was about eight or nine years old. I can't call his name, but that mm -hmm. would be inappropriate. Eight, nine years old. I never forget. I went to, to I saw him um, with his mother. His mother was so nervous and scared, you know, traveling from the UK and coming in with COVID, etc. Understandably. And I could say I never met anyone like him. He was like laughing. He's like, Doctor. I'm like, Hi, are you okay? He's like, Yes, I'm fine. And his mother's like, Oh, I hope he doesn't get sick. He said, Mommy, I told you, right? Stay positive and remain stay, stay positive and remain negative. That's what we all have to do because his mother was negative mm -hmm. at the time. I know what he told me. He told me something that stood with me. He said, Doctor, Doctor, Doctor Man, that's what he called me, Doctor Man. You know that it's the adult's fault. <laughs> like, what do you what do you mean by that? He said, if they would just listen mm -hmm. and take the vaccine, it could make a big difference and then I could go back to school. And be normal. And, and, th and that struck me. And it stood with me to this day. That I always say, tell people um, when they're, you know, weary and stuff. I say, you know, stay positive. That's a, that's a message for Barbados today. Or this evening. And dealing with children is completely different than it, dealing with adults. How, is, how are your facilities set up to deal with, it, with it, kids? It, it is. We had created a playroom for mm. kids. We did that with uh, some help from Corporate Barbados. Lots of help from Corporate Barbados. We set up a playroom. We have benches outside. We really wanted to have, you know, slaves and swingers and those stuff. We really did. We asked, but we didn't really, no one really stepped forward for that, to be honest. And a serenity garden at the back, which we've tried to, you know, the kids can play and stuff. It's something we're still working on. And dealing with kids is tricky. I am not a pediatrician, um, but we are in close contact. The pediatricians work with us on a day to day basis, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of referrals when we're unsure about certain stuff, et cetera. But the thing with kids is kids are obviously, they're not like adults. They don't want to stay in the room. They want to go outside and play. And we allow that. So they go outside, they play football, basketball, not basketball, sorry, football, um, cricket. I saw them playing cricket a few days ago. And at one point I stood um, from on the other side of primary and I'm like, it looks like a primary school, mm -hmm. like literally a primary school with kids out at lunchtime playing. And that struck a note in my head that these are the ones, Lisa, below that age group. And I know there's some studies going on now about vaccine in children and that probably will come out later in the year. But these are the ones who can't protect themselves. And that's the point I was making before when they say you're going through a storm. They're the ones that on the plane that can't protect themselves. We have the capacity to do that. The question is why we don't. Some people say, oh, you know, I can wait till next week. I can wait till next year. I can wait till a year and see what happens, right? But the decisions and choices that people are making impacts people who are helpless, it impacts people who can't take the vaccination. It impacts people like kids who are not in that genre that we have the evidence to say um, that they can take the vaccinations at this point. It can impact them and it can lead to their deaths. 
And most of the children, they have mild symptoms. They tend to have mild so, symptoms. So to be frankly, as most of them have mild symptoms, we had a few kids who had who got a bit nervous, who got a bit of moderate illness, but we were able to pull them back quickly. Children are resilient, but they're resilient, but they also can spread the virus just like anyone else. Yeah. And we're getting a daily report now on the number of vaccinated versus unvaccinated persons in isolation. And they continue to be, those in primary isolation continue to be those who are unvaccinated. We do have one person in primary who's who's vaccinated, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the others are unvaccinated, and I think that tells the story. I mean, coming out to the large, not yet complicated, but coming out to the large, the some large studies done internationally is quite clear, you know. Um, and I think one of the worst studies is probably coming out of, of um, 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 Israel in terms of that data. Seven percent of people vaccinated can still get ill and hospitalized. Right. We know that. I think. If you, if you tell people, if you get vaccinated, you can't get sick, you'll be like, I, I'm not about that. I'm very straightforward. Um, but the probability is you won't, right? So 93% of people won't. And 93% is a large percentage. 7% um, of, of people might. But we know for sure the other side, if you're not vaccinated, your overall risk for hospitalization are overrunning our healthcare system. And I think we're at that juncture, to be frankly honest with you. Right, overrunning our healthcare system, you know that risk is there, um, based on sure fact that I think as of, of today, and I know probably by the time this airs, the numbers are certainly going to be different. So nobody chastise me because the time you're listening to this, it might be forty people mm -hmm. or maybe twenty people, but there are many. The majority of them are in ventilator support. I think there's only one as of today who's not in ventilator support. And like I told you, and I know this airs later. Um, we added another person on the ventilator um, um, just this afternoon. The ICU team is working extremely hard. Um, Dr. Hassel, Dr. Lovell, um, and the, the Cubans, et cetera, and the anesthetic team who are now working with us as well. They are working extremely hard um, on a daily basis. And it is really heart-wrenching because it's a whole heap of Barbadians um, who have not um, certainly being, being vaccinated. And I talk to them, right? So sometimes I go in and I talk to them, whether they're in secondary first and then go over to primary or vice versa. Some of them are indeed um, sad at the situation they're in. Some of them are worrying about their families and, and many of them has, have kids, which is the hard part. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are like three or four situations where kids are in there being, you know, with uh, another person who's taking care of the kid because mommy is in ICU. Our daddies and I see you. That's crazy, right? And the average Barbadian don't know that, or they can't see. I just wish, I just wish, I can take you guys into mm -hmm. ICU because people don't. It's like people. It's like I don't get it. Like people don't actually. Some people say, "Oh, it's fake." I'm like, it's not fake. I don't sleep at night sometimes. My staff don't sleep at night sometimes. It's not fake. I will take you in, and if I could show you the cameras and show you what's inside. And I told some of the others in the balcony when I talked to the patients yesterday, I will take you down there, some of you young ones who are looking at me, and show you the consequences of COVID-19. It's real. It's troubling, right? If you look at our Caribbean neighbors next door, young people have died. Young, young people. Uh, as, as young as 18, as young as 25, you are not, you know, you know, what's the correct word here? You are not because you're young. COVID, there we go. I got it. COVID is no respecter mm -hmm. of person. Mm -hmm. It's not respecter of age. It's not respecter of race. It's not respecter of, 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 of color. It's no respecter of, of whether you have a comorbidities or not. Because I would tell you, the majority of people in our ICU today, I think there are four or five who have some sort of serious comorbidity of the 20 something that are in the high 20 somethings that are in there. So this is real, right? So people. So the majority be, are yes. relatively healthy. Yes. Young people, there are a few older ones, yes, but the majority are, are you know, young. I'd still like to think his 40 is young. Of course, of course. <laughs> right? And, and 40s. And I, I just, I was telling one of my colleagues a few days ago that it seems to be COVID likes 40 year olds or late mm -hmm. 30s. And that sounds crazy, but, but that's the reality. That's, every that's single, what you're seeing. Yes. Every single person that I can remember over the last few days that I saw that I sent from one of the schools or at Harrison's Point proper, 
you know, when the doctors are all stressed out, they're literally stressed. They were all in the 40s. It's like unbelievable. Like, I, and that's why I said, I wish I had the capacity to take you in there. Take this camera that I'm looking at today and get you to film and show people this is not a joke. And if we continue on this trajectory, right? I, I, sorry, I'm getting into my zone because like, it's, it's, it is hard, you know, seeing and knowing what's to come. And if you we see don't it every get day. It, and we see it every day. And then I see, I always worry, I always hear me talk about my staff because I know they're tired. Mm -hmm. They're literally tired. And then they see people doing crazy things and they're just tired. And they see on the street, I will like take this camera and the cameraman, if he allows, I will take the camera myself and be a cameraman and show people the reality of what's going on in Barbados. Because people see things on television in other countries and they believe it can't happen here. Everybody wants to continue life as normal. But let me tell you today, straightforward. Things are not normal at this point. That's not fear mongering. That's reality. They're not normal. And people have to stand up and do what they need to do to get us out of this storm that we are going into. They got to get vaccinated. They got to wear your mask. You got to social distance. If you don't have to go this place, don't go. Stay home. If the kids don't go, go and run about because the kids can go and run about with somebody mm -hmm. else's child and bring it back into the mm -hmm. household. And poor granny in the household, whether she's vaccinated or unvaccinated, is going to take a hit. And that's exactly what's happening, right? This is real. This is for real. This is no joke. Someone was wondering, in terms of vaccinated versus unvaccinated, in terms of the treatment, in terms of the doses of medication, is it different? No, no there's, there's no change in doses. There's, um, medications. People who are fine are treated symptomatically, but we watch them and this is what people get annoyed about right. because they're there and they're like, oh, I'm getting no fancy drugs. Well, if you get fancy drugs, that means we think something bad is right. going to happen to you. Um, the treatment is no different, to be frankly honest with you. The treatment is the same. So some of whether we use steroids or some of the other um, um, agents which we use um, sort of pull people back, I believe, on occasions from the brink. Um, you know, <laughs> You know, whatever you use those things or not is dependent on where they are. And we do not, I need to say it categorically on national TV. There is no difference in management of a vaccinated person and an unvaccinated person. The country can never separate like that. We can never separate medically like that. I could stand and shout and scream that. We treat every single client who is admitted to that facility the same. There is no difference and how we would treat a vaccinated and unvaccinated individual. In fact, I will go as far as to say that I often encourage people, people have asked me when they've come out to COVID, some younger people, young fellas um, from some very mischievous areas in the <laughs> country have said, Dr. Ford, you know, became pretty close. Dr. Ford, you know, oh man, you could get the vaccine now. And I think that speaks to understanding of where they could have yeah. been. It's almost like seeing your life, your life flash before your eyes. You didn't get sick. But it could have happened. Yeah. And when you see people around you being pulled out, three or four people, sometimes a day, sometimes twice a day, sometimes none, right? Pulled out a day. You get the reality is that could be me. And I think when you get the reality of that could be me, it's different. But for those out there who are going along their life normal or trying to be normal, but not following the things that will keep you normal, those are the ones I worry about, Lisa. I honestly do. In terms of those who are vaccinated, do you see the difference in how they're able to fight off COVID. Well, yeah, for sure. And it, it makes, and it makes immunologic common sense. If your body sees something like it before, when your body sees it again, it's able to say, hey, look, see you? I've seen something like you before. I'm going to attack you in this particular way. If you've never seen something before, your body never seen something like it before, when it sees it, it's going to be like, are you with me or are you not with me? And all of that time, the virus is replicated. So it gives more chance for the virus to cause damage to your body and that's exactly basically what happens um, with COVID-19 and the, and the unvaccinated individuals right I'm never going to get into debate Lisa about whether it should be mandatory or not mandatory I am somebody who believes that everybody has a choice it is their choice I say that on national tv that's not a directive from anywhere else this is me personally my, my thing I always say I speak from my heart and not because somebody tells me to say something everything I say is the way how I feel um, but but I would remember, I will tell you, I remember, if I can share something personal. Sure. I remember growing up and I remember lining up at school for vaccines. I used to cry 
because I was scared of needles. As imagine now, I'm not scared of sticking people, but probably I'm still scared of needles. But, but, and I remember that as well. And I remember there were times where I had fever. I could remember it like it was yesterday. We have had fever as a kid post, even when I was out to leave. I was 15 and I had another vaccination, I think it was MMR, if my memory shows me correct. Um, and I remember having a fever. And those are things that people kind of bicker about. You have a fever, you have them like, hello, <laughs> when you were a child, these are some of the things that you would experience with the vaccines. It's really no different. And I remember that. And I always think back to say, just imagine that I never got those vaccines. And just remember recently, within the last two, three years, I remember there's an outbreak of measles in the US. Mm -hmm. And Barbados didn't have to worry. Why? Because the whole population practically was vaccinated um, against measles. So even if someone came on an island, you know, it was not going to go anywhere because that was there. And I think so people have to understand, right? That's what people have to understand. And I remember that as a kid, because I remember, I remember, I remember it specifically with polio because I remember um, way before my mother died, I remember that um, under that context of polio. And it was, everybody was scared because I remember around that time, people were like, oh, if you take the polio vaccine, you can get polio and die. Mm -hmm. And my mom was a bit nervous, but she was confident in the healthcare system. She was confident in the advice that she was being given. And here I am today. And we do have enough ventilators as well on island. Yeah, I think at this point, like I said, you, when you're going through a storm, you don't know what's in the middle of the storm, but you prepare. And I think prior to COVID, you, I said it in my last interview with you, Lisa, prior what we were able to do is to try to get many of these things while the world was in turmoil with ventilators and stuff, we were able to get that. So we have enough on campus and then we have um, some that should be also being um, stored as well at this point. Of course, if people don't behave or fall in line and do what they're supposed to do, I can't guarantee you there's gonna be enough ventilators in country if we get it wrong. And, 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 and I say that in the context of yes, um, um, I know that uh, the Ministry of Health, et cetera, and you'll see and stuff, we've gone ahead and got an extensive amount of ventilators. But if things go downhill um, based on people's actions and behaviors, um, if people don't, for example, um, get vaccinated, because you know those are less likely to end up on a ventilator, for example, then we know where we're going to end up. There are choices for people to make. I can't make them for you, but you have to look at the context of where we are and make those choices. No, as many admissions as you get, you do get quite a number of discharges as oh, well. Yeah. Do you find that when people are leaving the various facilities, they speak to the doctors or the nurses and they say, look, I'm going to get this vaccine as soon as I can? There are two things people do. I wish, <laughs> just before I came here today, I got a, a, a and, and thank you, and uh, thanking you on national TV um, today. Um, I'm not going to call your names, the three of you. And it was just before I, I, I came down from Harshness, but I came to meet you. <laughs> um, and I got a brown box, which was sealed with an envelope up top. And I was like, what is this? And the others were like, for it has your name on it. I'm like, I don't know what's in that box. And three nice middle-aged to older ladies sent me a note. <laughs> These are, those are things that keep me going, if I was honest. And it said, hey, Dr. Ford, thank you so much for all the work that you and Dr. Carbon and the rest of the team are doing. And we know that you're very busy and we always see you up and down, up and down. And we put some, some snacks, we pack some, some snacks in this box. Bless. So when you're on the run, <laughs> that you can use them. And I mean, that changed the context of the way how I felt today when I saw the hundred and something admissions that we would have had um, at, at the time of this interview. And, and it seems like that that matter. People come out and they hug you. There are some people who come in that they're angry. And I understand. I always tell the staff, listen, you know, and they may curse you, and we get a lot of that. Oh, dear. You better believe it. And I always tell people, don't do that to the staff. They're already overworked and hard, mm -hmm. and it's not good psychologically. Mm -hmm. People curse, and they get on, and they're upset to be there. And I understand that. I do. That doesn't give you the right to be abusive. But I understand it. To the extent that you're angry, you don't be there, you're scared. People, when they're scared, behave in many different ways. And I understand that. Um, but I'm encouraging Barbadians not to be abusive to the staff. But when they leave, they're often very happy. The people who came and wanted to curse and take, take down the world and pull away, pull around Harsons Point and be angry in the school. And, and they left and they were thankful. 
but not only thankful, some, as I told you before, some would have come and said, Dr. Ford, one came today on campus. I won't say which campus, but in, the, in, in St. Lucie, that makes it easy to figure out. One came on the campus of St. Harris's Point. Today, today alone, I asked, when can I take my vaccine? It is things like that in my head that make you feel as though an experience like that can change people's behavior. It is those individuals I want, and I'm going to ask on national TV, if you had the experience of COVID, whether you were ill or not ill, I need people like you to come forward and speak. I really do. Because I can talk as a doctor. Mm -hmm. I haven't had COVID. I've managed it. Many of the others around have managed it. Many of the other doctors around have managed it. Many of the nurses have worked. Many of the RDs have worked. Housekeepers work. A hell of a deal. They have been around the cases. Right? But you and your experience, to my mind, will speak much greater than they even can today. A few months ago, you had some issues with people stealing. Has that been resolved? I can tell you, I am, I am proud to say today that we have not had the level of challenges with that as we had um, before. Okay. I think for, sometimes that's why I always say, Lisa, sometimes I'm quiet and you don't hear me for a while. When you hear me come forward, you know something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Like if you hear me say, step forward to speak like this, Lisa, we are not in a good place. And, but in, it's in, in that stead, when I spoke last time, and it, it kind of came out, it wasn't planned or anything. Uh, like I said, so I am. Um, and, um, and, and people, actually, when they were coming in, people were like, no, Dr. Ford, you're the man from TV. We ain't gonna carry nothing. We promise, we promise. <laughs> you know, and it was, it, it's like, it was like a joke. Mm -hmm. But I also recognized that people recognized. They understood. They, they understood. And then some people even donated right. back. Like people came, mm -hmm. they were like, okay, we realize you don't have this or you don't have that. Um, and it may have been stolen or taken away, et cetera, and they give it back. And, and that's, that's the Barbadian spirit. And as much positivity as you've had, you've also had a, lo a lot of negativity recently yeah. Yeah. in terms of the meals. Yeah. But w what's happening with that situation? Oh, boy. I, 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 I always say this. Huh? You always hear me say, look, when, we need, when, we have, when there's criticism, one needs to look back and see, is it real? Is it fake? Is it not? I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into that aspect. What I'm going to say is this. I think one has to use criticism as spin it, as in look to make it positive. Mm -hmm. Do your quality assurance and see. What I would say is our meals at Harrison's Point are great from my perspective. I will share it with national TV. I have the same meals that a patient have. And it's strategic because I want to see what the kitchen is putting out. And it's not necessarily coming at saying Dr. Ford on it all the time. It's like, I just go and take one of the meals and see what's being offered to the patients. And of course, with anything in life, you go to a restaurant and they serve X or Y, and they may have this today, or you go in a hospital X or Y, and you may not like it. And I keep saying, this is the opportunity for me to explain something, if you give me one Certainly. minute, to explain something to Barbadians. You may not like that meal, but we already have a system in place. If you want to order online, if your family wants to bring you food, you can do that. Really? It's... I didn't know that. But this is what I'm saying. So they can bring you meals. I told... The patients will tell you if, if any of them ever called in. They'll tell you that. I always tell them, if you have a pillow at home that you like to sleep on, that you're more comfortable, we allow you to bring it. If you have a sheet at home that you're more comfortable, we allow you to bring it. If I advise people if, if you want to come with those things, fine, we have them. But if you, yours is more comfortable, come with it. If you have a, a fan at home that you prefer, you don't like our fan, you're sure free to bring it, right? And then, and then, and then, and then. If you don't like the food, we have different versions. So there's vegetarian food as well. We have a chef. We have our own chef. And some of the pictures I saw, the, some I of the pictures some. which I sent out, and I heard, I heard somebody on, on, on radio, I'm not going to call their name, say, oh, you know, that's can't be true. They do. It does happen. They do put that little, what do you call it? I can't Basil. Remember. Basil <laughs> or mint. Yes. Yes. Because we're not serving 400 people at that site. Right. It's less than 200 for most of the points. Um, um, because people obviously in ventilators don't eat food. So it's not as many. So many other sites obviously are, are serviced by other, right. other persons. But at Harrison's Point, I can tell you for sure, um, we service. We've done a lot of quality assurance. 
um, with regards to that. Again, our chef, I think our chef was hurt. I can speak on his behalf today. He was hurt. He said, Dodd I can't believe you know, because so, but I will tell you this. I, I got, I'm going to spin this one a little bit, and I'll tell you this. You know, somebody compared. I think it was something about chicken back. I saw, yeah, yeah. I saw something that about video. a chicken back or something of that nature. But I'm going to spin it with this. I, Corey Ford, came up in a very humble, simple household with my grandparents, and I had many chicken backs that have gotten me to where I am today. A strong, I think I'm a strong fella in the midst of the storm, and uh, and I. I think many Barbadians have come up with chicken bats and chicken necks and livers and gizzards, mm -hmm. right? So I think although those things are important for people, I think the ultimate thing is that we have a healthcare system that is free, that provides stuff for us. And there are many countries across the globe that don't even have that ability or capacity to even provide um, at all anything, furthermore chicken bats. So while I understand that and I appreciate that, and I think it's important to understand um, um, criticism. Um, I think it's also important um, to try to appease people where you can and try to help people out of different circumstances, but also to understand as well that with every situation, every rising situation, um, there may be challenges and you have to fix them. You can't deny them. You can't pretend they don't exist. If you see a problem, somebody identify a problem. My style, always, the staff will tell you, it's not to ignore or to say, oh, it's not true or whatever. You go back, you look. If you have to get somebody external, which we have, we even brought in BTMI at one point to look to see how we can improve things. And they came in and gave us some, some ideas to fix it. The answer is fixing it, not denying it. You, you kind of touched on it in terms of what is expected when people get there. What can people expect and mm -hmm. what is expected of them? Okay. So... What can they can expect? And I think expectations sometimes drives people's behavior, so it's important. Mm -hmm. So what you can expect is a bunch of young people mm -hmm. who are nice and polite, um, um, for the most part, but tired. But I think what people need to understand, you come here and to the facility, everybody's different, Lisa. So people see us doing something on someone else, and they're like, wait, but that never happened to me, or the doctor hasn't seen me every day. But we restratify people. That's one of the things we do. So people who move out of the facility, we restratify them. So we say, hey, look, you are mild, a mild to moderate case. You are likely not to get into trouble, no comorbidities, and we might treat you differently. The nurses and stuff will generally do your vitals every day. The doctors um, generally would not come to see you unless something is wrong. If you're managing 600 people, then you have to restratify. There's no other way around that, any part of the globe. It's like you're managing the whole hospital at one site. And then post that, if something happens, then the doctors will come see, figure out where it, what's going on, and then move on. There are just general meetings which are held by client relations to help explain some of the key aspects of the facility. And I think that that's important. So, uh, and those things like, how long are you supposed to be here? People always say, well, nobody's mm -hmm. telling me how long I'm going to be mm -hmm. here. They'll tell you how long you're going to be here. And sometimes people hear, but they don't want to hear. <laughs> so how long are you going to expect to be here? If you're, if you're symptomatic, for example, it could be as long as 14 days plus. If you have no symptoms, and meaning from the beginning to the end, then it's going to be 10 days and you leave under 11. That's important for them, people to understand. People want to get that and grasp that. And I think that's important. For example, um, you know, what services do we supply? Yeah, we have washing machines, we have dryers. You're not going to be left up in the sky you know, with laundry. But if you don't like the stuff we have there, you can actually get um, um, your family to bring clothes and stuff to you. So it's not a prison. So people can bring stuff for you. They can't come in the facility to visit you, but certainly they can, people drop stuff off for people all the time. There were people from a different culture who were there who um, the culture would not allow them to consume certain things and they had meals brought on for them every day and we facilitate facili facilitate that um, along the line so yes um, um, these are some of the key things that people need to understand um, in terms of of even um, when do you leave the facility like when would you move from Harsons Point to elsewhere that's variable and it really depends on whether we how we restratify you so whether you go to school or not it doesn't depend on what color your skin is or if you're purple or green it depends on risk stratification. If you think you're high risk, we are probably gonna keep you a little bit longer. If you think you're okay, you're young, you're okay, probably not likely to get into trouble. 
we will send you pretty close, so maybe to Daryl Jordan, mm -hmm. right? Where we monitor you for a couple more days. And everything after that, you're fine. You move on to the next site. You can almost like move through the system, um, right? So the only other site that we provide that level of care um, um, pretty early on will be Black Mongolia. So some people will move to Black Mongolia. They're probably intermediate risk, but you're just not sure where they're going to swing. And you have a, maybe somebody have a hunch that everything is not there. You'll, they'll go there because they have a mini ICU there, a uh, high dependency unit there set up. So that's kind of like how it, how it goes. There's no mystery to Harrison's point. There really isn't. Um, I took you guys, took guys in there before. Um, and there's really no mystery. Um, so those are some of the key things um, that people experience. I think one of the hardest part for persons, of course, is that first call that you're positive. Someone collects you. Sometimes I would say in this, I need to say this though, let me, sometimes there are some challenges. I think with every system there's a challenge. And we're trying to figure out ways and means around that. So sometimes we move people pretty late, sometimes at 10, sometimes at 11. It's not normal. It's usually in the midst of a, you know, a serious bump as the airplane is going through the storm. So you have, if, if a day you know you get like 109 admissions or 110 mm -hmm. or 90 somebody admissions, you have to shuffle people around, risk stratify, look at, and, and sometimes those moves happen a bit later than we would like. Um, this is something that we're working on. I think they, we have a full client relations team now trying to, to work on that aspect to try to perfect it so that the moves are made a little bit much earlier because um, admissions come in sometimes up to 2, two o'clock in the morning. And this is why I tell people, stop watch. Can I just say this? Stop watching the numbers online. Say, oh, this man said 10 and this man said 20. It's because it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's a dynamic situation. So this morning with the retail admissions, like I could give you the number that was for this morning when I got the number. And I'm sure by the time I get off of, of this, it this program, change. it's going to be different. It might be 10 people more. So if you ask me at that point, I will tell you 120 patients. Not really, but mm -hmm. 120 patients. But then you're going to say, oh, but you told me 90 this morning. It's because it's dynamic. Positive tests are happening throughout the course of the day. And so the numbers are not sometimes like that. So just please, you know, be trusting of us the, 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 the best you can. Trust in God first, of course. But be trusting us and, and trust for us to try to get get you through this bad weather um, that's ahead. No, if Barbadians follow the protocols, we could get this right. If we don't, we could get this very wrong. Yes. You've been at the forefront of this since last year, February. Yes. yes. What do you want? And I know that's a really broad question. What, do, what I want? do you want? I want a long vacation. <laughs> 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 a long vacation. Far away from everything. But you know what? That's not the reality of things mm -hmm. right now. What I really want for Barbados to do right now is to be positive, but stay negative. Be positive in thinking. Be positive in prospects. Don't be fearful. It's okay to be fearful. Right? But to stay positive in thinking. How do we stay positive in thinking? Thinking past this. Thinking how we're going to get past this. Wear your mask. Physical distance. If you don't have to go and go to the supermarket, not go to the supermarket to pick up one thing. And lastly, get vaccinated. Simply that. Stay positive. And remain negative. If you do those things, it's like the Swiss cheese model. Mm -hmm. If you do all of these things together, you can impact what happens in this country now, but not only now, in the future. In the future for you, in the future for your kids, and getting them back to school. Every single child in this country wants to get back to school to see their friends and family. But it's what we as adults can do to help them get there. It's up to every single one who's listening to make those decisions. What are we going to get out of the storm? It's a nice smooth weather. It depends on every single Barbadian. Thanks, Lisa. And Dr. Ford, I hope you get that long break that you so very deserve. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. That is the island's lone infectious disease specialist and head of the island's isolation facilities, Dr. Corey Ford. I am Lisa Lord, and this was One on One.